Second Chronicles chapter 20. Passage I've preached on a few times. I'm just looking for answers. I don't know about you, but I read through my Bible. When I read back through it again, I find sometimes notes I've made or places where I've hit the passage before and it registers, it reminds me where I was way back when I read it before. And I see the passage differently the next time through it. And I see things in the passage that I didn't see before, not that it wasn't beneficial before. But you see things from a different perspective. And sometimes for me, as metaphorical as it may sound and maybe even silly to some of you, sometimes it's just good for me to get back to the simplicity of the basics. Just get back to where we need to get to and find out what to do when we're faced with things we don't understand. We all face that. None of us, including what we're hitting now, are going through anything that you haven't been through and that others of you will go through. But nonetheless, it's what do we do when? So here you have a situation that occurs here where Judah is fixing to be invaded here by Moab. And the Bible says in chapter 20, verse 1, it came to pass. After this also, the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. There came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and on behold, they be in Hazraz and Tamar, and which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together and asked help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Brother Larry, you pray, would you, and ask the Lord to help us out this morning. Lord, thank you for being here today. Lord, we lift this hour before you and, and give it to you the best we know how. Uh, we surrender, our Lord, the best we know how our hearts to you. Our Lord, and this time set aside to hear the Word of God preached. Lord, we realize unless we do that, uh, the word will still go out. But Lord, there's not being in hearing or much less in receiving of it with our hearts not being prepared. Yeah. So we ask you, Lord, for help. If we've ever cried out for help, we cry for help at this moment. My Lord, for your man, for your preacher, our preacher. I pray you use him one more time. And thank you for him being here. Thank you for his help, Lord, to preach the word of God. Yes. Yeah. I uh, thank you for you being, Lord, the only solid thing in our life, Amen. Uh, God, that uh, we can hold to by faith that you've given us, uh, Lord, to believe, first of all, through salvation, God, then the Holy Spirit granted and who dwells within this fleshly temple, uh, God, that you might be used of us. So, Lord, we want to use you as much so as we know how and call to you for help, uh, Lord, for this hour. Pray you, t you preach your man one more time. The words, Lord, that you've given him for us. Pray God that uh, they would come mildly. And uh, that we have, have enough sense, Lord, to, to take the word in and use it. Lord, we need your help. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. A little bit of a spoiler alert here. You get to the end of this chapter here, although a large amount of time has passed from the beginning to the end, you find out in verses 27, 28, and 29 that they win the battle, or the Lord wins the battle, and the nation of Jerusalem returns with joy. The fear of God is on all the other kingdoms around them, which prevents them from being under attack again in the future, and the Lord gives them rest from all their enemies. I'm not big on when it comes to reading. I don't always like to go to the last chapter and read how it ends. Otherwise, what's the point of reading the book? I remember reminded of a time we were going through a real difficult situation down where I used to work. And uh, there was a 
a pretty major thing that was going on. And I remember my dad wrote me a, a poem during that time. And at the last paragraph of that poem, he said, uh, everything is going to be okay, bud. I've read the last chapter, we win. I, I want you to understand that sometimes it's good to jump to the last chapter and realize all things do work together for good to them that love God, them that are called according to His purpose. But during the times of difficulty, can I say first and foremost that Jehoshaphat faced something he hadn't faced before and he'd heard it from more than one direction. Listen, we're fixing to be overwhelmed. You are completely surrounded. There's absolutely no way from a military standpoint that you're going to be able to overcome these odds, the things stacked against you. There is no question that once we get attacked, you are inevitably going to be defeated. And Jehoshaphat did what I think is important for all of us to grab. First of all, he says in that passage around verse 2 or verse 3 there, he set himself to seek the Lord. I think the first thing that's important and imperative for us when we go through things like this, especially with things that are difficult or hard, that it looks like there's no way to get out. The first thing we have to do before we're overwhelmed with what's coming is, is to go, you know what I need to do? I need to make sure I'm hooked up. I need to make sure my fellowship is where it needs to be with the Lord. I need to make sure that the chatter is off the line, that it's a clear communication, that we're able to get through what needs to be gotten through. I like the idea. He drew a circle around him and he said, Lord, in spite of what may happening with the enemies, in spite of what might happen with the nation and all the military people that might be gathered, step number one is I need to make sure me and you are where we need to be. I think it's funny that it's in the Old Testament. It happens to be all the way in Chronicles, but that principle remains true for us today. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily. Paul said, I daily have to put off the old man and put on the new man. Uh, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I find the Apostle Paul practicing exactly what Jehoshaphat practiced. And he said, the first thing I need to do is, is I need to set myself. I can't ask other people to do what I'm not willing to do myself. I would say the situation here is very desperate. I would say that of all times that there was a king that ever needed leadership on what to do and how to be able to go about this, if nothing else, to prepare the people for a great tragedy and even a slaughter, might even be considering what would a surrender look like. Oh, what would we do if we go into captivity? What's it going to be for our women and children? How would they prepare the households for being overtaken by two of the most wicked nations? As a matter of fact, the Ammonite and the Moabite are not supposed to be anywhere around or involved with the nation of Israel. And they're fixing to now come in there. How would you prepare? You know what he said? First thing I better do is make sure I'm straight with my commander. I think that tragedy oftentimes comes in our life and it's a great time just to check up. It's a great time just to make sure that uh, if he just chooses to speak up or to be quiet, at least I'm in the place where that can take place. I like second of all in the passage right there, something that's not necessarily done very much nowadays, although there's a lot on the internet, there's a lot on YouTube, there's a lot in uh, uh, people that are writing things about dietary habits and this, about intermittent fasting and fasting here and there and fasting and the other. But from a spiritual standpoint, Jehoshaphat the king, you know what he does? He says, I'm going to proclaim a fast. What are we going to do? We're going to push aside the carnal things. We're going to push aside the fleshly things. We're going to push aside the physical needs. If there was ever a time we need to get a hold of God, we need to get a hold of God now. The Bible said after he got himself right, you know what he said? The Bible said he claimed a fast, not a feast. He said, it's time for us to knock off that thing that we seem to enjoy the most. In Isaiah chapter number 58, there's a great passage that's written there about fasting and how they had gotten to the point that it was just a religious ritual and it was no longer done for the purpose of getting a hold of God. But the Apostle Paul says in one of the things there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, before he jumps into 12, you know what he said? In fastings often... You say, why? Well, one of the things it does is make you realize you sort of lose your taste for the pleasures of life. I mean, if there's fixing to be a group of soldiers that are going to come in and do God knows what, 
How are you going to prepare the people that you're over, that you're in charge of, the people that are going to be under attack, that you can't protect? You already know that your arsenal does not have, contain the necessary equipment to be able to defend against such an onslaught. And you're realizing that women and children, let alone elderly people and invalid people, are fixing to be taken captive and most of them be... How would you prepare for something like that? No wonder Jehoshaphat feared. I don't believe Jehoshaphat feared in the sense he was a good man, he was a good king, he loved the Lord. So there's no question about that. I don't think he's fearing in the sense of, I'm afraid of my death, I'm afraid of, I'm going to lose my life, I'm afraid of me being tortured. I think he fears for the fact that he cares about the other people that are greatly dependent upon his influence over them. And if he falls, what's going to happen to the people that are there? The Bible said when he feared that the first thing he did was he sought the Lord. The second thing he did, the Bible says, was he prepared to fast. And the third thing he did was he called on other people to say, hey, we need to get together and pray. This, serious, this matter is a serious matter. I know many of you have had the benefit of having that happen before when tragedy comes your way and knowing what it's like to have people that call you and say, I'm praying. Or some people say this and they kind of say it tongue in cheek. They say, well, all I can do is pray. All you can do is pray? I'll take all you can do. I, I don't look at that in the negative sense. I take that in the positive sense. All I can do is that's everything I can do. The most important thing that you can do is to be able to pray. Jehoshaphat said, we need to get together to pray. And look at that. He gets ready to stand up. Guess where he's at? The Bible says he stands up in the sanctuary. You say, where is he? He's in church. You know what I do know about trouble sometimes? It has a tendency to drive us back to where we need to be in the first place. Yeah. I'm not saying Jehoshaphat hadn't been going there, but I am saying that when tragedy comes our way, don't we have a tendency? You remember when the towers came down? Do you remember when the Pentagon was uh, bombed or when the Pentagon had the, the, the missile hit it or the plane, whatever it is that you want to believe about it? When we were, quote, under attack as a nation, when we didn't have the details, we didn't know what was going on, uh, the president was reading nursery rhyme, they whispered in his ear about the towers coming down and planes hitting the, the things and all that kind of a deal. Whatever it is you want to believe about all that stuff, the nation as a whole felt like it was in tremendous trouble. And isn't it interesting? Churches begin to fill to capacity again. And people started going to churches of all denominations because they thought, man, there's something going on here and we don't know what's going to happen. And if they were able to infiltrate our airspace and to be able to hijack airplanes and those kind of things to do the kind of damage that they did, they thought it was the beginning of a long-term thing and that they were going to all of a sudden be sleeper cells cropping up all over the United States and that we were going to be under attack. And you know what people did? They said, you know what we better do? It's time to head back to church. Churches were staying open 24 hours a day. People could come in and pray. You had signs that were hanging out on churches. You're welcome to come in and pray. And people would leave the doors open for people to come to the church house to pray. I know generally speaking that when time comes toward the end of things, when things appear to be difficult, when they appear to be hard, it has a tendency to us to, can I say this, put our priorities in the proper order. I mean preparing to die. Preparing to set your house in order. Why? Because all of a sudden, whatever you've lived your life for, it seems so infinitesimally small when all of a sudden the on the horizon is now eternity. You know, that thing that's always been out there for a long time, and now all of a sudden, it literally, you can see it in the real close future. You begin to think, wait a minute, man, I better start changing my priorities because all these other things that I think are so important... It won't matter if my soul is lost. I can't imagine if an individual was reading this and they were unsaved. I, I can't imagine that when you get ready to have that situation in your life that you don't have somebody to turn to. Can I say this as you go a little bit further in the passage? Look, if you will, down in verse number 6 and 7 when Jehoshaphat begins to speak. I want you to say that when he starts to pray, the first thing he does is, is he remember who it is that he's talking to. And he starts talking about his power and his ability and, and who he is. He's kind of reassuring himself while he's talking to the Lord. I don't know if you've ever prayed that way before. 
I don't know if you've ever approached the throne and said, God, you know, you're a good God and you're a smart God and you're a strong God and there's nobody that can stand up to you and you've gotten me through this and you've gotten me through that. I mean, he does that in 7, 8, and 9 there. You know what he does? He's saying, Lord, you got us through over here and you got us through over here and you got us through over here and you did this, Lord, and you did this, Lord, and you did this, Lord. I mean, you ever think about it? Lord, you brought us out of Egypt and you brought us through the Red Sea and you brought us throughout the wilderness and you had us to be able to survive and we took over Canaan and now we're living here and now we're doing this and God, you've been real good to us. I mean, before he gets into laying out the trouble, you know what he does? He starts reminding God, remembering who God is and reminding him of past deliverances. God got you through this far. Does it stand to reason he may get you through whatever's coming? You say, how's it going to come out? Well, the problem is, is that Jehoshaphat doesn't know when his faith's going to get tested in just a little while. Can I say this about that, that oftentimes trials we go through are literally a, a trial of your faith because you can't see how it's going to come out. You ever had a kid that winds up getting married and you, you're thinking to yourself, man, this is probably not going to work out good. But you don't really know, but boy, does it cause you to pray. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes the kids go prodigal. And sometimes things don't work out how we would draw it up. But tell me that that's not a trial of your faith. You say, why? Because you don't ever see what the outcome is. You know what happens when he gets ready to talk to Jehoshaphat? He calls on a guy and he says, Jehoshaphat, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call a preacher in here and the preachers are going to tell you what to do. And I'm going to really try your faith. If you're going to put yourself in my hands, instead of you fighting that battle, Jehoshaphat, I'm going to fight the battle for you. As a matter of fact, when you get ready to go out onto the battlefield, I want you to go out there and sing as if you've already won the battle and that you've already fought the war. Because uh, when you get out there, I don't want you taking spears I don't want you taking uh, uh, shields. I don't want you taking uh, machetes or knives. I want you to just take me out onto the battlefield. Now you think about this from a king's perspective. That doesn't even make any sense. Does it? I mean, they're fixing to fight a battle, right? They know that there's an attack coming and it's armies that are properly armed to come out there to fight against them. And the Lord said, I got you. Don't you worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. By the way, leave all your weapons at home. Well, I don't know about you, but that'd be kind of difficult to say I'm going to get thrown down in a den of lions and don't and leave your chance to have some kind of defense, your spear and your buckler and your shield. Leave that up there. I'm going to take care of you. Boy, you talk about a trial of your faith. Amen. I don't care how much prayer and fasting you've done. I mean, when push comes to shove, when the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen, and all of a sudden God says to you, okay, I'm going to go ahead. I've heard your prayer. I appreciate your fasting. You've done the right thing. You've unified there together. You've come together in the church house. You've remembered who I was and the power I had and you've remembered what I did for you in the past. Now here's what I'm going to do for you in the future. I'm going to fight this battle for you. You're going to have to trust me when I tell you I got it. And I'm going to put your faith to the test because I want you to go out on the battlefield and I want you to sing as if the battle is already won before you ever even see the enemy. And by the way, when you leave the house... Leave that pea shooter at the house. Leave that spear at the house. Leave that shield at the house. Now, think about it. You're going against two of the most wicked heathen tribes that exist that are known for butchering people. And they're being told to go out without even a fighting chance or a chance to defend themselves. I don't know about you. I don't know that I got that kind of faith. Read the passage right there, if you will, with me. Notice what the Lord says to him in verse number 12. Wilt thou not judge them? Have we no might? Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Lord, we're trusting you to do it, right? Hard to keep your eyes on the Lord when things get bad. All Judah stood before the Lord, their little ones and their wives and their children. I mean, everybody's involved. That's how serious it is. That's why I think his mind was on the little ones. Jehaziel comes up there and speaks. He says, listen to him in verse number 15. And then he says, thus saith the Lord in verse number 15, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Woohoo! <laughs> 
Still a lot of them peeps out there. They're armed to the teeth. And you're telling me I'm only armed with faith. Yeah, God's got it. Hard to walk it. Tomorrow go you down again. Behold, come by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Judah. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still. See the salvation of the Lord, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground in Judah, and he fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And then when he stood up, he began to praise God there with a loud voice. I, I, I got to be honest with you. Jehoshaphat's either crazy or he's got a lot of faith. The Lord said you're going to win the battle. That'd be like the Lord told me I'm getting a Cadillac tomorrow. I mean, think about that for a minute. He's going out to battle against these individuals and the Lord has told him, the Lord's going to do this. Leave your weapons behind. Be ready to go. He goes and prays, jumps up shouting and says, praise the Lord, we're all good. What are we going to do, King? What's the battle plan? Uh, lay out the blueprint. Show us where all the people go and how we divide up the tribes and the battalions and how we get the squads and, and the plan of attack and all this. Oh, there's not a plan for anything. We go out there like we've already won it. Leave all your weapons behind. The battle's the Lord's. Boy, that's easy to say. But this is not just the battle's the Lord. The outcome is the Lord's. And Jehoshaphat begins to set himself to lead the na nation of Israel. And instead of leading them into battle, notice what the Bible says. They go into the wilderness there in verse number 20. They believe the Lord and you shall be established and believe His prophets and, and you shall pro prosper. Look in verse number 22. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord sent ambushes against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir and they were smitten. But not until they began to act as if they'd already won. You say, preacher, that just sounds like foolishness to me. I think it's a good testimony. Amen. I think the fact that remains is, is that the Lord says, I told you I got it. And I got it no matter what the outcome is. Can you say praise the Lord? Remember when the Apostle Paul and uh, Silas were in prison there in Acts uh, 16? And they're down there in that prison and they're beaten and they're put in the back part of the prison there and they're in shackles and, and the Philippian jailer has stuffed them back there where there's nothing but roach and rats fighting over uh, food scraps. And Paul says to Silas after they've been beaten to within an inch of their life, Paul says to Silas, he says, hey, uh, let's sing a song. Can I say this? Paul, you don't find anywhere in that passage where Paul said, let me out of prison. You don't find anywhere in the passage where the Apostle Paul says, man, God did us dirty. We came over here to answer the Macedonian call. And what do we get for our effort? What do we get for our trouble? We wind up getting beaten for doing what's right to do. And now we're in here. Everybody's going to forget us. Matter of fact, all of our friends and all of our families and all of the people are on the other side of the pond over there. I mean, what in the world are we going to be able to do here? You don't find that with the Apostle Paul at all. He said, you know something? We have something to sing about. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Ain't this a blessing? Silas has got to be scratching his head if he could reach it because of the chains and stuff. He has to be thinking thinking to himself, Paul, are you crazy? And Paul said, no, you don't know God like I know God. I know that whether we ever walk out of this prison cell or whether we die in this prison cell, God's got this thing and He knows exactly what's going on. I'm so glad to be saved. I'm so glad to know that I know Him. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities nor angels nor things to come nor things above, things above and things below, uh, principalities and all, can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I don't know what they sang. Maybe the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But it wasn't until they started singing that the earthquake happened. I'm not saying you should be praising God in your trouble, but if you thank God for your trouble, He said, give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you thank God when tragedy comes your way? That requires your faith, doesn't it? Because oftentimes when tragedy comes our way, don't we have a tendency to just default for a minute like, why them? Why, why that? Why should they, right? Why, don't we have a tendency to default to that? Almost thinking we're insulated from that as opposed to Jesus Christ. If there was anybody that should have been a why them, it should have been Him. 
And then when we get our turn in the barrel, it's like, well, Lord, I don't mind helping others, but Lord, when it's me, the Lord said, yeah, but your faith doesn't get tried when it's for the benefit of somebody else. It's when you're in the hopper, Jehoshaphat. It's when things are going in your life, Jehoshaphat, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the testimony is made. That's when you get revealed to you who and what you really are. It doesn't make you, it just reveals, do you really have the faith that you claim that you had? Jehoshaphat said, man, listen, we ought to sing. And of course, you know what happens when they get out there, they begin to sing and praise the Lord. And when they get there, you know what happens? All the people that are out there that are, that are uh, already dead, it takes them, if I remember reading this correctly, it takes them three days to be able to gather all the spoil. They thought it was going to be the worst thing that ever happened. But it wound up being the best and most beneficial thing that could ever occur. They thought that we're all going to be annihilated. It's going to be done. Israel, Ju Jerusalem, Judah is going to be wiped off the map. Uh, we're going to be done for. The other town, the other cities are going to come in here, overtake us, enslave us, kill us. Uh, we're, we're completely done for monetarily, militarily. We're finished. Materially, we're done for. And yet what winds up happening is, is what looked to be the worst tragedy winds up being the greatest event. And it takes them three days to be able to have the spoil just to carry it back and put it back where it would have never been had they not been there. You know what I believe? I believe the Ammonites and the Moabites that they brought all that stuff over there. The Lord had them gathered together for war for the purpose of prospering Israel. And He had them be the ones to bring it over there instead of Israel going and invading them and having to bring it over there. He had them all bringing it. And then guess what happened? They got it all piled up there. And then when the Lord whooped them, the Lord said, okay, now here's what you need. Now here's what you want to get out of this. Now you understand why you didn't need a shield and a spear. Because you can't carry those two things and carry the spoil back. Now that you're on the battlefield, you need both hands to carry the treasure that God brought your way. So I told you not to go out there and fight conventional warfare. In 2 Corinthians 2, he tells, or 2 Corinthians 10, he tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He tells us in Ephesians 6 that the Bible's right, that the battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness in high places. We can't understand. We don't see what it is that God's doing or what He may be doing that looks like inevitable defeat and impending attack that's coming our way that we're certainly going to be overcome and swamped. It might be the greatest prosperity we've ever experienced before, but you have to wait till you get to the end of the battle to be able to do it. What do I do in the meantime? Whatever God tells you on a daily basis. What's the first thing I do, preacher? Set yourself to seek the Lord. Find out what lesson you have to learn in the tragedy you're involved in. Be willing to push away from the table to get God to answer you. Be willing to set an example for other people to see. Don't be afraid to call other people and say, Hey, can you pray for me? Can you help me? Don't, be a, don't, don't quit coming to church just because things aren't going your way. And for the Lord's sake, brag on the Lord and don't forget whose hand you're in. Amen. Ultimately, we're all going to shed this thing that we're in right here. Amen. And when we shed this thing right here, eternity begins. That's real life. And once we're up there with Him, what doesn't make sense to us now, we'll be up there with Him. And the Lord will say, by the way, the reason I didn't have you bring any weapons with you when you came up here to the judgment seat is you're going to need both hands to carry all that. Not interested in you doing the fighting there. The interesting is fighting down here. But once we get there, you need both hands to carry away the rewards. I don't have an answer, ladies and gentlemen, for all the things that are going on. I can foresee, I think, if the Bible is right, that there's going to be some significant tragedies that are going to come our way as a church and as a nation. The way that things are going right now, it seems to be that the devil more and more every day gathers more and more ground and seems to be taking over more and more things. The, the, the mindset of the way even people think nowadays is so twisted. It's like, it's, it's not COVID brain, it's demonic brain. But, but, the, but the stuff people are doing now, it literally, it makes absolutely no sense at all. If there was ever a time that it looked like we are surrounded by a bunch of imbeciles, if there was ever a time where it looks or gives the appearance of maybe that the, uh, in, the, the, the inmates are running the asylum, it's where you are right now. 
I've seen some crazy things in my life. I mean, firsthand personal things. I'm seeing things now I've never seen before. Yeah. I'm hearing things being said now I've never heard before. I mean, the, the idiocy of some of the things that are being done. It's absolutely insanity. And when you look at that, you know what you can do? If you're not careful, you can get real depressed. Yeah. And you can real get real downtrodden and you can get real discouraged. And the next thing you know, you think, well, Lord, you know what? We're just as good as whipped. No, you're not good as whipped until the Lord blows the horn. Amen. When the Lord blows the horn, guess what? He's read the last chapter. And we win. Amen. What's going to happen in between time? Anything and everything you can possibly imagine. What is my job? Set myself to seek the Lord. Be willing to pray and fast. Remind myself of God's past deliverances. And then put the rest of it in the Lord's hands and accept whatever the outcome is. And sometimes, you know what happens? The Lord lets the people there in Ziklag be taken. He don't win every battle. He didn't, doesn't look like He won Calvary. That's a couple thousand years ago. There are still people that don't accept that that was a victory. You say, what's going to happen? Even at the rapture, it won't appear that He's won anything except to those of us that are saved. Until the second advent comes along, you won't be able to see that. Maybe another year, maybe another two years, maybe another ten years. I don't know how long it's going to be, but we go the way of all the earth. What's my job? i got to set myself to seek the Lord. Get my fellowship where it needs to be. Walk with the Lord. Talk with the Lord. Trust Him to take care of what needs to be done. Seeing as if I've already won the battle. Can I just tell you, I'm not always happy-go-lucky in singing the songs of joy. But that Bible does say the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. And the Bible says, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joy and gladness of heart, that the Lord allowed a yoke of iron to be put upon their necks. So what do we have to learn to do? We have to learn to joy in spite of trouble. Jehoshaphat's got a great game plan there for you. What do I do in times of trouble? The first four or five verses, if you never got past that, are enough verses to help you through any tragedy that you're going to go through. So do you think tragedy is coming our way? Sure. The Bible says, uh, Job said, if a man is born under trouble, as a spark fly upward. Well, what do we do? Set yourself to seek the Lord. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to close this morning. I'm going to say this to you. You might do yourself a great benefit not to come to the Lord, and the first question you have, and it wasn't Jehoshaphat's, was not, why is Ammon and Moab coming against me? Can I say this? They weren't coming against Jehoshaphat. They were coming because they were enemies of the Lord. A lot of things that happen in your life are not because of something you did personally. You're just lined up with God's enemies. And as a result, if the Bible's right in Ephesians 6, there's going to be things that are going to happen to you that unless somebody is carnal or backslidden or unsaved, they're going to think it's something else. But if you're spiritual enough, you know what it is? It's what's coming your way. Why? Because of the team you're on. Nothing more, nothing less. Why? I'm doing what God told me to do. You say, what? It draws enemy fire. And as a result, it's not because of you. Don't take it personal. It's not personal. Amen. It's about Him. Yeah. What do we do? We comfort. We do our best that we can. And we sing. You say, why? I've read the last chapter. We win. Amen. My dad was uh, passing away there. And we spent some time there with him. And you've heard me tell the story. I won't bore you with all the details. But when my dad was passing away and talking about different things going on. He was very concerned about his testimony in the end. So much so that he said, if I do or say anything that would be hurtful to my testimony, tell him to give me something and knock me out. Now some of you may think that's silly, but what he realized was, is like Moses at the end of his life is still going up and concerned about how other people see him. Uh, my dad said to me, one-on-one -on -one in the hospital room there together, he said, son, you don't understand if I don't finish this right, all they'll remember is, is that I didn't finish right. They won't remember all the years of everything you remember. You're my son. You remember things. Some of my closer friends may remember things, but people will only remember how I finished. I've never forgotten that. 
You say, what is that? That's an individual that's willing to die much at an earlier age than I am right now, and he's getting ready to face eternity, and he's thinking about eternity. You know what Jehoshaphat's thinking? Okay, Lord, what about me? That's a great time to be selfish. What do I need to do? I need to make sure the channel's open. I need to recognize that it's the nation that's being attacked because of your affiliation with the right things, not the wrong things. And don't take it personal. Consider it an honor. Consider it a privilege. And remember who God is. And no matter what the outcome, God knows exactly what He's doing. Amen. Father, I pray you'll bless your word this morning.